Yes, that's fine. Um, we're going to get started with the first session, which, um, as Malcolm has already said, okay, is entitled Does Hybrid Warfare Exist? So uh, the broader uh, purpose of this panel is just to have more theoretical debate and a bit of an academic debate on um, what we're really talking about when we speak of hybrid threats and hybrid uh, tactics um, and whether hybrid warfare is an appropriate term to use. Um, we have a very distinguished panel with us today. We're going to change the uh, speaking order slightly than how it's listed in the program. Uh, firstly, I'll just quickly introduce our, our panel. Um, Mr. Bob Seeley is a member <laughs> of Parliament for the Isle of Wight, and he's already ready to go. Um, he was previously in the Soviet Union working for the Times newspaper, after which he was deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan as uh, in the Army Reserve. Uh, for which he received uh, numerous awards. Um, he's also been a research associate at the Changing Character of War program at the University of Oxford and has written numerous publications on the topic of Russia and Ukraine issues, hybrid warfare, and unconventional and new forms of war. Um, we Next to me, we have uh, Mr. Martin Murphy, who is an associate fellow at RUSI, specializing in naval affairs, unconventional warfare, piracy, and general uh, maritime security. His previous positions include adjunct professor at Georgetown University, um, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C., visiting fellow at King's College London's Corbett Center for Maritime uh, Policy Studies, and senior research fellow at Dalhousie University Center for Foreign Policy Studies. Um, Adrian Nish at the end of the table. Dr. Nish is uh, the head of the Threat Intelligence Team at BAA Systems um, Cyber Defense Division. Uh, as well as Associate Fellow at RUSI. He has participated in multinational operations to tackle cyber uh, criminal groups, as well as led research into a sophisticated cyber espionage campaigns um, to date. His other research interests include data-driven security, the emerging discipline of cyber threat intelligence, um, and he regularly advises government and business on evolutions in the threat landscape. He also holds a PhD in physics from the University of Oxford. And last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Samir Puri, who is a lecturer in international relations at King's College London with a specialization in armed groups, counterinsurgency, and peace processes. Pe sorry, peace processes. Uh, he was previously a defense analyst at the Rand Corporation, after which he worked for government, uh, the FCO in particular, on counterterrorism strategy and policy support to several peace processes. Um, he was also seconded to the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission in Eastern Ukraine, where he reported on ceasefire violations and weapon withdrawals in line with the Minsk, Minsk process. Um, but to start us off, I'm going to hand the floor over to you, uh, Mr. Seeley. Thank you very much. How, how long have I got? Five minutes? Or do you want to take my five minutes? Okay. Thanks for being here. I'm just going to rattle through some arguments. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying I think hybrid war is an insidious and growing threat to Western democracy and it is a global problem that needs a global response. So it's a global problem that needs a global response. I don't think we understand it yet, and we're not there yet with some of the conceptualization. I'm gonna put some ideas out because I've developed a framework over the last few years as part of my own thesis studies into Russian non-conventional war, and what I'm trying to do is get that framework accepted, but A, by government, uh, by a foreign ministry, but also by the number of select committees that are currently investigating uh, Russian influence, not only in the United Kingdom, but internationally as well. And I, I got on very happily onto the Foreign Affairs Select Committee last week, and so I'm working with the heads of select committees to find a way to get them to cooperate on this issue as much as possible um, and to provide a common framework of understanding. And that's in part because I think in America, because of the incredible and increasingly bitter divisions between the Republicans and the Democrats, I worry about the bipartisan nature of any attempt to understand the Russian threat that they're going to do over there. They've done some great work. The Senate Intelligence Committee has done some great work um, and has some very interesting testimony from Facebook and others, about 126 million people being reached during the presidential campaign in 2016. Uh, but I, I do wonder, and I hope that the UK Parliament is going to develop and produce some really good work on hybrid war coming up. I'm just going to rattle through some ideas in a hopefully entertaining way. It's always a pleasure to listen to Malcolm, and I listened to him very carefully, and I disagreed with at least three things he said, so we're going to cover that very quickly. Um, I, I'm a member of parliament now. I spent a um, bunch of time, I mean, as a journalist, I suppose you do understand it's information warfare. I did, over the last 
eight, nine years of real warfare, uh, and I'm now involved in politics. So I hope that's a useful combination to seeing some of the different facets of so-called hybrid war. Three definitions, maybe. There's the old Middle Eastern definition. Hybrid war was something done to us by Iraqi insurgents who had social media. That was basically insurgent tactics plus a bit of clever cyber, a bit of clever propaganda, or a bit of clever online. So cyber plus, um, so insurgency plus online. Then you have a Chinese definition, which is very espionage, commercial theft, intellectual property theft, um, uh, co-option and corruption of individuals. If you look at Australia, they're doing a bunch of reports. I've got a piece in the Sydney Morning Herald, I hope on Saturday, saying that we need to work together, us to understand the Russians, uh, our friends in Oz and elsewhere to understand the Chinese. Then you have the modern Russian definition, which is really full spectrum war, as Malcolm said. We haven't got a framework. I propose one, basically six elements. Within these six elements, there are lots of sub-elements, and with those, those sub-elements, there are between 50 and 60 individual tools that I've identified in the last few years. And I've hopefully researched, some of my research has come out on this through Rusia and other people, and there'll be more coming out in the next year. So hard power, soft power, economic power, active measures, the old political sort of troublemaking, information power, diplomatic power. You can subdivide those further. So in soft power, you have governance, culture, religion, sport, uh, probably another couple. And within that, you have separate tools as well. So doping is potentially a tool because the Russians care about their international image in sport. Uh, within political power, those of you who remember the Soviet Union, active measures. This is the disinformation campaigns, the smear campaigns aligned with stuff like assassination for Litvinenko, poisonings, and all these other tools, poisonings, uh, um, presidential candidate Yushchenko, maybe up to a dozen murders in the UK alone, um, very sophisticated poisoning now, at least four types, dioxins, radiation, um, very powerful opiates, and some other stuff that the KGB or the FSB, whatever they're called, the group of assassins. Um, all that, those six elements are wrapped around C2 because we need to understand who's running this. And the C2 is part of the problem. The command and control is part of the problem here. That we don't understand the command and control. And I know Malcolm was saying it's overt. Actually, it's pretty covert or it's certainly deniable. And there are a series of characteristics, flexibility, deniability, that come with this form of warfare. But a lot of it is not deniable because it's pretty obvious. The Russians have two divisions in eastern Ukraine, one in Lugansk and one in Donetsk. So, you know, it's technically deniable. Um, just a couple of other points. Tell me when to stop talking, and I will, possibly. Um, <laughs> um, uh, defined asymmetric. Uh, Malcolm was saying asymmetric was insurgent plus online. Not anymore. The Russians are doing asymmetric across the board. It's asymmetric conventional. That's what the AD, the Air Defense Kit in, Kalani in Kaliningrad is doing. They, can't, they haven't got the shock armies anymore, but they've got unique bits of kit that level the playing field and make Russia not uh, fully defeatable, but very difficult to defeat. If push ever came to shove in a very unpleasant, traditional, kinetic, conventional war in the Baltic, it would be difficult to destroy the Russian air defense kit. And they know that, that's why it's there. And likewise around Murmansk, and likewise around all these other places. So this whole conventional asymmetry is part of a, an unpleasant dance with the West over power and positioning in various parts of the world. They've got an air defense bubble, a big one over Syria, that covers the Inchlet uh, air base in Turkey. So they're changing the dynamics of Western freedom of action. So that's asymmetry in conventional. And yes, they're then doing asymmetry in unconventional, which is the information war, the cyber war, the online stuff. You know, announcing a, an anti-Muslim protest in Texas at the same t through a front group, the same time in the same place, they announce a pro-Muslim protest to get violence on the streets of America and violence on the streets of Europe and then get the media along to discredit democracy. Uh, what else? I'll rattle through it. One other thing. Gerasimov doctrine. It's not the Gerasimov doctrine. And I'm not just saying that because Gerasimov came after all the initial round of imperial wars in the early 1990s, and I'm not saying that because the military aren't important. But this is not a military articulation of warfare. This is the spooks and Putin as an ex-big spook well, he's now a big spook. He was a little spook uh, in Eastern Germany once upon a time. This is the spook's warfare, which they have told the Russian military that we are now doing, that Russia is now doing. Russia has tried conventional war in Chechnya. It was a bit of a disaster, frankly. But the unconventional warfare they've tried in Moldova, in Georgia, in Ukraine, and other places has been quite successful in screwing up those countries. 
So what they're doing is that Putin has said, this is the future of war. The spooks have said to the military, this is the future of war. G the Gerasimov article in uh, Vine Commissioner Korea, I think it was, was basically Gerasimov saying to the military, this is, this is the new game in town, and we have to follow these rules. It's Gerasimov saying, I've been told this by Putin, and this is what I'm telling the military. So that's really important. So it's not a military form of warfare, it's a spooks form of warfare, but fully alive. So you've got active measures, cyber, and all these sort of dodgy political tools, which are usable. And the Russians love this, because it's nuclear weapons, but it's usable. That's what they say. I don't think it's a great comparison, but it's what they say. That's aligned with all the other kit, like kicking off revolutions, conventional, SF, etc. <coughs> I think I'm going to leave it there, because I'm probably running out of time, but thank you very much indeed. Good morning. Um, I was sort of comforted by, I saw Ridley Scott at the BAFTA Awards so that he could never be an actor because he could never remember his lines. So um, it gives me some comfort that I'm probably standing in his shoes as well. So the exam question this morning was, does uh, hybrid warfare exist? I think the simple answer is, of course it exists. How could it not? Because it's essentially a, a reconceptualization of warfare as has been played out through the bulk of the 20th century. It's as if we in the West have hit a snooze button in 1991 and then woken up again in, in 2014, and um, this was playing when, the, when we woke up. Uh, same tune, but with a different arrangement. Moreover, if the Russians accuse us of doing it, and we accuse the Russians of doing it, then surely there must be something in it so what is it? Arguably, the heart of hybrid warfare is our old friend, uh, political warfare, uh, updated for modern conditions and updated with a more overt use of, uh, of military coercion. I mean, we recall that George Kennan uh, defined uh, political warfare as the logical application of Clausewitz's doctrine of Clausewitz's uh, uh, doctrine in a time of peace. And he went on to say, so you've got to take some credit for this, uh, that the British Empire survived because, uh, was created and survived because we were better at political warfare uh, than anybody else. But, he then went on, uh, political warfare reached its ultimate form under Lenin, who brought together Clausewitz and Marx. Now, um, it's interesting that the NATO advisor, but seeing what Russia's done and how it articulates its position about hybrid warfare and, and, and blames us all, uh, NATO advisor David Ruiz Palmer uh, suggested that Russians are particularly adept at seeing devilry in their own concepts uh, when they're played back to them by the West. Now, admittedly, we can be poor at attributing, um, giving credit where it is due. For example, the, um, the in, in the in the 80s and 90s, in the revolution of military affairs, we were insufficiently uh, thankful or give sufficient attribution to the Russians for their thoughts of, uh, in the 1970s, for the military technical revolution, which they couldn't fulfill, of course, uh, because they didn't have the economic power to be able to, to build the weapons and the systems that the RMA required. Now, while Russia may be wrong about the color uh, revolutions, um, though I was interested in the comment about the, uh, the National um, Institute for Democracy, Endowment for Democracy. Um, now, I'm, I'm sure that the Kremlin will see that as warfare, um, their support for the color revolutions. Regardless of what the color revolution, and we were particularly poor when it came to the Green Revolution in Iran, um, but we weren't mired of the mark, um, given what the West did in Guatemala and Iran and getting rid of Diem in South Vietnam, <laughs> Congo, Guatemala, you know, the list is, is pretty endless. So it's against this background, uh, when we look at Georgia, Crimea, and the Ukraine, um, even threats in the Baltic, that nothing of this is new. Um, just as after 1991, we thought that the Russians had become civilized, i.e. they become more like us, when in fact they thought we hadn't changed at all when they looked at the Balkans and particularly when they looked at Kosovo. Crimea, if you like, was just paying us back with our own coin. So what justifies 
using hybrid or hybrid warfare as terms of art rather than political warfare or even the smorgasbord of terms grey zone, ambiguous and so on and so forth which is which has arisen and it will be a wonderful rummage in the hayloft to go into all that. But why do we use the word hybrid warfare? I think the simple reason is that the technology has changed. Um, state actualized hybrid warfare uh, brings together political warfare, what we used to call political warfare, which is also information warfare in terms of its old definition, uh, elements of the RMA, RMA, particularly C4, ISR, and precision guided musician. Um, I knew I'd make that mistake. It'd be a lovely thought of an information warfare played out by precision guided musicians. But never mind, I meant precision guided munitions um, and clearly uh, um, information warfare. Now, information warfare is, is divisible uh, between you know, disinformation and propaganda on one side and deception and, international and, and information operations on the other. And of course, everything can be either covert or overt. So, what can we sort of sum this up? First of all, uh, Russian war uh, hybrid warfare is a Western term. Russia doesn't do hybrid warfare. It doesn't do foreign copies. It does new generation warfare, which is Gerasimov's term, or it does the more the term they prefer now to use, which is uh, new type warfare. Um, either way, they're both very like hybrid warfare. Now, on balance, hybrid warfare in the West leans more towards, towards multi-modality, and you could argue that uh, on the Russian side, it leans more towards the old Soviet concepts of deep penetration and uh, what they call reflexive control, which is all part of psychological operations and hence information operations. Now, militarily, um, hybrid warfare is geographically constrained. Uh, in Russia's case, it is close to its border, operating in and near abroad. Conventional military force uh, is a key element. Uh, given the uh, presence of Russian minorities, there's a powerful leverage opportunity. And as we've seen in the Ukraine, it offers a proxy sanctuary as well. So then if you like, beyond that in initial circle, there's a wider circle, uh, which we can describe as, as a semi-military, and that is confined or constrained to Europe when we're seeing shows of force and we're also seeing economic coercion. And then beyond that, there is, if you like, the whole non-military global ring, which contains all the elements that you see in this long non-military global ring are actually present in the other two rings as well. So blurring the lines between peace and war, the idea of, of, of centralized control. That's not to say that there's a strategy, but there is the ability to uh, exploit opportunities in with a well-defined, well-understood centralized control system. Whether that would last over a long conflict or an armed conflict, then I think is questionable. Then there's the whole business about deception and disinformation, and then what we like to call cyber, but which the Soviet, the, the Russians roll into information warfare. So bottom line, uh, hybrid warfare is a slippery concept but has one huge rhetorical advantage. It's woken or reawoken Western policymakers to the recognition that war is only limited by the political, social, and cultural <coughs> understanding of the protagonists. And also, hopefully, that the main battle space is in the mind. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to present my ideas on the basis, obviously, of being an academic, but really drawing on reference for the year I spent in East Ukraine as well. Um, I certainly think the activities that we're talking about clearly exist. I don't necessarily think hybrid war is the best way for us to get used to describing them. And that's what I want to introduce, I guess, as a bit of a, a counter argument. And the reason I say that is we're very much into buzzword territory very much into having a casual catch-all uh, pair of words that we can wheel out to describe a whole range of activities. And sometimes the consequence of doing that is cognitively, we don't then descend into the level of what is it we're actually talking about 
in terms of specificity. That's what I put out to you. I'm not denying that Russia is doing what it's doing. So it's a buzzword. And uh, I think some of the themes that uh, Sir Malcolm introduced at the, at the end of the first session uh, and what we've already heard are very pertinent in terms of what I think is actually happening. One of the most important words I think that is, should become more uh, part of our vocabulary is uh, escalation and controlling escalation. We're talking a lot about threshold, and I think we should talk about escalation and controlling escalation as well. Um, it's nothing new in combining the means and tools you have in a devious, ingenious way to outfox your enemies. And following exactly on from the previous speaker, if you couldn't do that, then nobody could ever win a war or seek any kind of advantage in any sort of adversarial confrontation. All war is asymmetric. You're always looking for the asymmetries to exploit and to exacerbate to seek advantage. And uh, I also think, and I say this uh, sort of subconsciously as well, part of the reason that term hybrid war has gained so much currency is we need a piece of vocabulary to express our discontent at being outfoxed in a particular series of theaters. And it's also part of that, I guess, reeling back finding a term that we can put around doctrine and very sensibly to give ourselves a, a vocabulary that we can talk easily about what's happening. None of that is necessarily a bad thing. We just need to be, I think, self-conscious as to why it's gained currency. So I deployed to Ukraine not long after MH17 was shot down. I was there for about a year. Um, it certainly struck me as tragically ironic that 100 years after the outbreak of World War I, what I saw in front of me in Donetsk Oblast, which is where I was posted for a lot of the time, was very much akin to a 20th century uh, industrial level piece of warfare. Many of my colleagues who the FCO had also deployed were ex-armed forces, I'm not. They'd been doing counterinsurgency and counterterrorism work for the last 15 years. They're sort of having an 80s redux moment because they're big pieces of armor. They're, we went on patrol to visit soldiers who were digging trenches to hide from the we weather as well as shell fire. Uh, we saw the DPR and the Donetsk People's Republic using a lot of the same kit as the Ukrainian military, because of course it's all from the same sort of start point, if you like. Um, obviously, I was working on the ceasefire, and that's the kinetic side of it. There's a whole other piece, which is the subversion piece, which wasn't part of my job. So I'm very aware that what I saw was the, the war, and it was a war. Um, some people can say that it was a show war for the you know, Russia Today broadcasts, but there were positional issues that were being fought over in 2014, 15. Since then, it's become much more static, and that's why the Minsk process is quite moribund as well. So I certainly know what I saw, and when I sort of come back from Ukraine um, to start my, my post as a lecturer at King's uh, in 2015, I, have, I, I was sitting down with the Neil Ferguson part one biography of Henry Kissinger, and he got to the part on the Bay of Pigs, this is your point about previous instances. And I read the operational ingredients for the Bay of Pigs misadventure. And it was actually about empowering a diaspora who were in exile uh, to go and kick out uh, the Castro regime. CIA, of course, had a certain level of involvement, quite a lot of involvement, and there were propaganda activities, radio and the rest of it. You know, JFK signed off on that. So we've got lots of other examples from across the Cold War. As a combination, I can describe it as follows. Conventional war, proxies, Subversion, subversion being activities that undermine but are short of violence, as a RAND definition I often go back to describes. And if that's what we're talking about, conventional war, proxy war, subversion, then we, sh I think, need to keep reminding ourselves that when we go to hybrid war, actually, do we mean cyber against our domestic political system? Do we mean agitation at the sort of a former imperial borderline? What do we actually mean? The other part, I think, that doesn't get spoken about so much, but is really relevant today, in New York is Russian diplomatic top cover. And that to me is almost the real hybrid, is the interplay between the use of proxies, the use of some Russian forces, as Bob Sutton said, uh, but also the way the Russians are able to lock in their diplomatic approach. I was part of the OSCE mission. I'm pretty sure the reason the Russians signed off on the OSCE is because it's a diplomatic um, body they can influence and control, and it could manage the conflict. We could never stop the conflict. We didn't have that uh, particular mandate. I'll talk just for a couple more minutes before handing over. Other terminologies that have become, I guess, quite uh, common, gray zone warfare. I think The Economist, if you'd have read that the next war special from about three weeks ago, had quite a piece on gray zone warfare. Again, it's not so bad. They focus, I think, very sensibly on the, the centrality of ambiguity. And we know that with both cyber and with the use of proxies, the key is confusing attribution. 
I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about that in the, in the last, uh, with the last speaker as well. So once again, we get more of a sense of what the vocabulary uh, sort of breaks down from simply hybrid war, breaking it down further into the sorts of activities. Uh, another peril of hybrid war is it focuses the mind and, of course, our responses on tools. And as we know from our strategic studies literature, it's always ends, ways, and means. And I think the ends and the ways can sometimes get a bit lost when the focus is on the proxies, on Wagner, on troll farms, on you know, Russian volunteers, quote unquote, in Ukraine. And that issue of what is the objective is probably best expressed uh, in terms of, of course, geopolitical fluctuations, a more reticent US for different reasons, for Obama sort of compensating for the George W. Bush era and for the chaos in Washington at the moment. Also, we of course know that the, uh, the lead sort of pack, if you like, in terms of uh, GDP levels will be changing. Everyone knows that around the world. Sergei Lavrov has spoken about, um, uh, it's not multipolarity he uses, but he uses a different, polycentric. The world is becoming more polycentric. And the way that I formulate this is powers like Iran, Russia, China, each in their own way, are looking to play the language of diplomacy at the international level, never to escalate into a great power confrontation, but to probe at the regional level. Each of them are probing at the regional levels in very different ways. And that's where I think the issue of exploiting ambiguity, uh, controlling escalation and operating below a certain threshold uh, makes a great deal of sense. From Russia's perspective, I think the key issue of deniability is that what they're doing is rhetorically deniable. Not that it's actually deniable, because it's absurd when you actually say, well, it's just volunteers off duty, and it's lunacy when you think about it. Um, but the point is, uh, someone like Lavrov is able to rebut um, some of the accusations using some of the same vocabulary that they feel they've been bashed over the head with in terms of self-determination, humanitarian intervention, regime change, all the rest of it. They're able to manipulate those particular arguments. So once again, I think the rhetorical uh, gift of this particular strategy is another really important uh, aspect of it. And in terms of countering, this is at the diplomatic level, we need to be thinking about, well, what sort of language do we use to actually discredit that particular um, way of speaking? So then just to round off, and I fully agree with the characterization, of course, that this is, you know, the spooks are in charge. Um, writing a book at the moment, one of the uh, subtitles is, you know, turning tradecraft into statecraft, because that is precisely what the Putin generation of people in charge in the Kremlin have actually done, is they've, of course, empowered the ability to engage in superficially deniable operations. But the mentalities that come with sitting several steps removed from the actual operational end is a very prevalent mentality. There's always the ability to offset responsibility, to offset blame. Rhetorical as well as strategic, it's actually remarkably clever because you avoid quagmires that you can get stuck in indefinitely. So I think I'll round off there, but just to reiterate that first warning is there's nothing necessarily wrong with hybrid war, but just to remind everyone about what happened with COIN, as a, a buzzword about 10 or 12 years ago. There's nothing wrong with coin as well. But we'd lost, I think, some of our strategic nuance because it became a buzzword and it started to become appropriated by all sorts of communities involved in stabilization missions when perhaps maybe the level of intellectual nuance was being lost through the urgency of needing a vocabulary. So I'll round off there. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning. Um, so uh, I think uh, Dr. Murphy might have been on something with the uh, introduction of the term precision-guided musicians, because um, I, I, I you, you're probably all familiar with the Internet Research Agency. There's been a lot of stuff in, in the press uh, about it, as it was mentioned earlier. So the, the Internet Research Agency, or, or the troll farm, is, is run by uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, I can't pronounce his name properly, but he's, he's affectionately known as Putin's uh, cook. He is a, a friend of, of Vladimir Putin, and he acts as a proxy for that activity. Uh, Putin's money is believed to be controlled uh, by Sergei Rozdugin, uh, and he is uh, Putin's cellist. So he is a, a musician, and possibly a precision-guided musician, uh, if, we, if we want to use that term. Um, so I, I'm a recent addition to the, the panel, so I'll, I'll take a little bit of liberty, maybe, and, and not address the question so directly, uh, but perhaps provide a few anecdotes from uh, my day job, which is uh, investigating cyber attacks. Um, one of the big areas for us uh, in our investigations is 
cyber espionage. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, looking at the, the, the technical components of that, but also trying to understand the, uh, the motivations and the, the details behind it. Um, and th there's probably some lessons that we can learn there from uh, espionage. It's been around for as long as states have, of course, uh, and uh, uh, certain norms have built up over the, the centuries around espionage. It's not necessarily part of hybrid warfare. It may enable warfare, but it definitely exists in whatever this gray zone is between peace and conflict. It, is, it has some, uh, some existing status. If we look specifically at cyber espionage, though, uh, there's a certain amount of contention around uh, conducting cyber espionage that we don't necessarily see in, in, in normal espionage. And I think that's partly because cyber espionage is an active technique. Uh, a lot of traditional forms of espionage, such as signals intelligence or uh, geo-intelligence using satellites to take photographs, they're passive. They don't interact with the, uh, with the target. But in cyber espionage, it, it necessitates getting into systems and actually interacting with those systems. Now, that may be for stealing information, but of course, once you've got access to those systems, you can potentially uh, create data, you can modify data, you can destroy data, you can do all of those other things. Uh, and so there's a bit of a blurring of the lines between espionage and, uh, and some of these other uh, activities that we see in, in the cyber domain as well. So perhaps I, didn't, I wasn't entirely accurate when I said our, our day job is, is investigating cyber espionage. What we're, what we're actually doing is investigating intrusions into networks. Uh, and we assume that the attacker is, uh, is conducting espionage. We assume that the motivation is espionage, but we don't ultimately know. We're making that judgment. And again, it's that uncertainty about what is the motivation of the attacker that I think uh, has uh, some resonance with uh, hybrid techniques as well. The um, uh, interesting uh, sort of cases that we come across are where attackers get access to things like critical national infrastructure. Now, again, it might just be espionage, it might just be reconnaissance, but it could be that they are pre-positioning for some other attack, some sort of sabotage attack or, uh, or, or some other uh, case like that. Uh, and perhaps that is the motivation in itself. It's to leave us thinking, what is the adversary doing? It's to leave us uncertain about what their motivation is, so we're constantly chasing our tails. Now, we've seen um, recent cases uh, where uh, authorities in the UK have actually responded and, and publicly attributed uh, attacks such as WannaCry to North Korea and uh, Pecha, interestingly, to the Russian military. So we're seeing some cases of uh, attacks, but also counteraction and response from public authorities here and, uh, of course, in the US with the indictments last week, where uh, there is definitely an escalation in terms of what those authorities are, are doing. And perhaps there's some lessons that we can learn from cyberspace in terms of how those uh, authorities are reacting that we can, we can take to other uh, domains as well. So the, the uh, case against the Internet Research Agency, I think probably most of you are familiar with it, again, affectionately known as the, the troll farm, 13 individuals uh, indicted last week. Um, many of these were previously linked to the agency. Many of these were previously known uh, to be associated with it. Some are even already under uh, sanctions. Uh, it's unlikely we'll ever see them inside a US courtroom. So you could ask the question, what is the point? It was sending a signal, it's sending a message that this activity is neither covert nor uh, acceptable. Um, the technical details also prove useful for the likes of the social media companies, uh, Twitter and so on, whose platforms are being abused so they can understand what's behind this. They can then have the resources available to investigate uh, and try and mitigate that, that activity uh, through private sector means. So al although cyber is not necessarily, um, uh, although cyber is, is relatively new, I think one useful uh, thing we can draw from uh, cyber, which we can learn lessons from for other areas of, uh, of hybrid warfare, is uh, the tempo of attacks, the, the, the number of observations that we have through cyber give us templates for what we can use to understand uh, other activity, uh, which may then be used to, uh, to, to counteract those, uh, those actions. So what does this all mean in terms of, of outlook? Well, uh, a few years ago, people used to talk about a lot about norms in, in cyberspace. I don't think we talk about that so much anymore. I think now we're in a state of actions and counteractions, uh, and it's really very hard to see where this is all uh, leading. Obviously, the, the technical landscape uh, evolves, but also the geopolitics is evolving. 
espionage may or may not be uh, part of, of hybrid warfare. Uh, it's often a pretext to something else, though. So we saw quite a significant uptick in espionage against Ukraine in 2013 and 2014 in advance of conflict there. We, see it, uh, we saw it in 2015 in, uh, against the Middle East uh, in advance of uh, Russian troops on the ground in Syria. Where do we see it now? Latin America, interestingly. Quite a lot of activity in Latin America. We don't know why necessarily, but it's worth looking into uh, what that's telling us. Cyber is just one domain. There's uh, similar discussions we could have about uh, financial, legal, diplomatic, military aspects. But I think the, the, the useful uh, thing we can draw from cyber is that we do have a steady stream of observations, and from this we can uh, infer something about doctrine and intent uh, and also appropriate responses from uh, authorities as well. So I'll end there. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Nish. That was very interesting. And actually to all our panelists, I think you raised um, – a lot of interesting uh, points on how we define what hybrid is and whether it really is something new. Um, I was thinking of a quote that um, Lavrov actually gave, I think it was in 2014, when he said uh, that you know hybrid was an interesting term, but I would apply it above all to the United States and its war strategy. It is truly a hybrid war aimed not so much at defeating the enemy militarily as it is changing regimes and states that pursue a policy Washington does not like. It is using financial and economic pressure, information attacks, using others on uh, the perimeter of our corresponding state as proxies, and of course, information ideological pressure through externally financed non-governmental organizations. Is it not a hybrid process and not what we call war? I think that's fascinating um, in relation to what you said, that it is a term that we're using because we feel that we are not in a position to necessarily uh, beat it at the moment and that we come up with a term that uh, just effectively exposes our own weaknesses when in effect we potentially in the West have also been doing quite the same. Um, so really interesting to start thinking of it from our own perspective, not as something that is um, done defensively towards us, but also that we have been employing um, offensively and whether it therefore really is something that's new um, to, to us uh, in our own context. Um, I'm going to open it up the floor. Um, if you could again just introduce who you are, uh, then that would be great. Thanks.